All right, we're in 6A. And 6A is, by the way, I was watching the, the video last night, and there's all of a sudden this black object goes across the front. And I'm thinking, what was that? And I said up something about it, and I realized that whatever got my stool, and I walked in front of the camera. <laughs> okay, didn't hurt anything, but yeah. But it was kind of funny because I didn't know what it was. Ah. Okay. Let's see if that goes. Yep. Okay. What component opposes the flow of current in a DC circuit? This is important. DC. It's called a resistor. If you want to think of a resistor in a in my mythical uh, fire hose example. A resistor would be a thing that goes in and <coughs> restricts the flow by putting in a uh, inch diameter thing in the middle of a two and a half inch hose. Two and five inch, what is the standard? Okay. It's, it resists the amount of current that will flow through. Like those things you can put in the shower head. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'll, that, that's a good one. Yep. The ones that I don't put in because I don't like them. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, I know, now the greenies will be. Uh, okay. What type of component is often used as an adjustable volume control? It is called a potentiometer. It's the thing you turn when you turn the volume up and down on, the, on radio. Potentiometer. It changes the potential. Although, if you look at the word, it would look like it, you were measuring the potential, but it's not. It, it's an adjustable volume control. What electrical par parameter is controlled by the potentiometer? Resistance. A potentiometer is really a resistor that you can vary the number of ohms, up and down. What electrical component stores energy in an electrical field? We did this before, remember? By a little two plates with an insulator between them. It's called a capacitor. Does anybody remember what the unit of capacitance is? Farad. Farad. And the units of inductance is a Henry. What type of electrical component consists of two or more conductive surfaces separated by an insulator? A capacitor. For some reason or another, they are hung up on capacitors and you will get almost certainly one of those questions. What type of electrical component stores energy in a magnetic field? An inductor. Did we do these? No? Okay. What electrical component usually is constructed as a coil of wire? An inductor is nothing more than a coil. It could be a three turns of wire. It could be 3,000. It could be on an air core, it could be on a uh, ferrite core, but it's still a coil. What electrical component is used to connect or disconnect electric circuits? A switch. You use one every day. What electrical component is used to protect other circuit components from current overloads? A fuse. One little side light. Never, never ask a Marine for a fuse. <laughs> uh, without describing which one you want, you may get the wrong thing. Which of the following battery types is rechargeable? Okay, we have rechargeable batteries, ones that you can put on a charger and charge. Nickel metal hydride, that is NIMHs, and you've probably seen that term somewhere. Lithium ion, yeah, those are the ones that burn up hoverboards and homes. And the lead acid gel cell, which is nothing more than a variant of your car battery. All of those are correct. Which of the following battery types is not rechargeable? The carbon zinc, okay. Does anyone know what the other name for the carbon zinc that we're using today is? Why we use one? Alkaline, yep. The alkaline battery is the old carbon zinc battery from way back almost, very little change, 
except they changed the uh, uh, material inside, the wet stuff inside. By the way, there is wet stuff inside. What class of electronic components uses a voltage or current signal to control current flow? You take a small current and you alter uh, the flow of a big current. Sort of like a hand on a valve. Or like a relay with a conductor. Uh, yeah. It's called a transistor. All a transistor does is has one lead that you change the voltage on or current on and the flow going through the other side changes. Okay? What electronic component allows current to flow in only one direction? Diode. Yes. The AC coming out, out of the wall, electronics don't like. You've got to reduce the voltage. We'll talk about how to do that later. But then you also have to change it into DC that only flows in one direction. And the diode only allows the ones, one direction to flow. Which of these components can be used as an electronic switch or amplifier? A transistor. You have a small current that changes a bigger one. That's called amplification. Which of the following components can consist of three layers of semiconductor material? It's a transistor. It has three leads. They hit three layers of material. The current flows this way, and it's altered by the one in the middle. Which of the following components can amplify signals? A transistor. Have you guessed you're going to at least get one of these? Okay. How is the cathode lead of a semiconductor diode often marked on the package? A semiconductor diode can be anything for something that looks like a little glass bead with two wires <coughs> on it to a package that's molded plastic that's bigger, depending on the diode. One thing about it is the cathode, the plus end, has a, has a stripe on it. On the glass bead, it's a black stripe. If it's a gray, a gray or brown plastic package, it's, it's, again, it's a piece with two leads. But there'll be a white stripe on that one. And that's how you tell. And by the way, if you wire it the wrong way, Instead of plus being here, it's minus. There's also a couple of other bad things that happen. Like a, an LED, which is a diode. If you wire it the wrong way, it doesn't light. Okay. But the stripe is the indicator. What does the abbreviation LED stand for? Light emitting diode. What does the abbreviation FET stand for? It's called a field effect transistor. It has one particular use. Field effect transistors can take very, very tiny signals and amplify them. That doesn't amp amplify them a lot, but it takes them from a very tiny to a tiny. They're usually the first transistor when you come into a radio from the antenna. First thing that they hit is a field effect transistor. Not always, but that's, that's one of the uses. What are the names of the two electrodes for the diode, the anode, and the cathode? And the cathode's the one with the stripe. Which of the following can be, could be the primary gain component of an RF power amplifier? Anytime you have gain, you have basically two choices, a transistor or a tube. And we don't have any of those anymore in the test. So it's a transistor. An RF power amplifier is an amplifier that goes, that takes maybe 5 watts and takes it up to 40. Or 5 watts with a couple stages takes it up to 180. In other words, it's something that will allow you to produce a lot of power. <coughs> What is the term that is you, that what is the term that describes a device's ability to amplify a signal? It is called gain. 
Gain is measured in dB. 3 dB is double, 6 dB is quadruple, 10 dB is times 10. And it's gain. Typical transistor gain is somewhere usually between 10 and 20. And you've got to get about 80 dB, 80 dB of gain to get from the antenna to the speaker. So you have several of them. What is the name of an electrical wiring diagram that uses standard component symbols? It's called a schematic. I love this. Yeah, I'm going to hand these out. Although I buried them in the, uh, the presentation, I still want you to have the able to look at them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, what you're looking at there with the, uh, if you're looking at the side that has the, this transistor, that's the one, you have the, that's the one, yeah. The, one's a block diagram, the other ones are schematics. The block diagrams I don't think are used anymore. Okay, it's called a schematic. It's how things are connected, not how they're laid out on the board, how they fit, what they look like physically, it's what we think of the mass. And some of these will have, have, have some fun. We're going to be looking at that diagram. What is component one in figure T1? The resistor. If you were an electrode trying to get from one side to the other, wouldn't that slow you down? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, number two, I'm, I'm betting it's a, a switch, right? Well, just wait. Okay. But number T1 is a resistor. It's going to slow you down if you had to take that path. It resists or impedes your progress. What is component two in figure T1? It has three leads. Anything that's three is probably a transistor. If you look at it, it's got one coming in from the side, from the resistor. That's the one that controls it. The other flow goes through the light and the battery. By the way, that's what three and four are. And depending on what current is coming in on, on the, from number one, determines how much goes through the other side, which determines whether the light goes off or on. Okay? What is component three? It's a lamp. We haven't upgraded to have that be an LED. What is component four? Component four is a battery. It's an old symbol that dates back to Volta's Pile, the guy who made the first battery out of wafers of metal and cloth soaked in salt water. Okay, here's a more complex one. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you what this circuit does. These two leads are put down in a sump pump hole high enough that they only get touched if the sump pump doesn't run. And when the some pump doesn't run, the water gets high enough, the light comes on. I have a friend that I actually wired one of these for. It has other uses, but that's the rule. I wired one of these for because that way he could have a, an LED up in his kitchen that if the sump pump quit running and the water came up, he found out about it before he went down and found that everything in the basement was floating. Okay, this is a little more. What is component six in figure T2? Now, I want you to think for a second. Two plates, not touching, separated by an insulator. That's a capacitor. If you look at the, if you look at the picture, 
If you think about the description of a capacitor, that's it. The fact that it has got one side curved says that it's a certain type, not discussed in this class. But there are some variants of those things that will tell you. Okay. What is component 8 in figure T2? Okay, think about this. Look at 5. If you were an electron going through there, the path would be easy going to the left or to the right. But the path wouldn't be easy going to the left. So it's a diode with the electricity going in one direction. All right? What we're doing here is changing AC to DC. This number 8 is a diode. But it's got those little squiggly lines coming out of it which says it's emitting light. Okay? And by the way, number 10 is also another kind of diode. I don't think we had a question on it. What is component 9 in figure T2? Well, 9 is a re obviously a resistor, right? But it's got a thing on it that you can change. It's called a potentiometer or a variable resistor. They're both the same thing. It's two names for the same thing potentiometer and variable resistor. Remember back to the question, it says, what does a potentiometer change? Resistance. What is component four in figure T2? Component four is two coils of wire with an iron core between them. And if you have 100 turns on this side and 10 turns on this side, you put 120 volts in on this side and you get 12 out on this side. You, you, you can take voltages up and down, AC. <coughs> and if you go down the road, you'll see 50 of those on a pole. Except they're working with 12,000 volts down to 110, 220. Okay? That's, and that's really what's inside that. Oops. Transformer? Yeah, okay, you did it. Okay, what is component three in figure T3? Okay, again, like the transformer, it's a coil of wire. But it's not a transformer, it's an inductor. Okay? And oh, by the way, that little arrow on the side means something. It's a variable inductor. Anytime you've got an arrow sticking somewhere, it's variable. So right off, when you see that arrow, it has to be one of two things. It has to be a variable something. If you look at the two answers, what well, do you got choice? Variable capacitor, variable inductor. And oh, by the way, a capacitor is two plates. So it ain't that one. Anyone want to guess what figure, t, fi, figure two is before I go to the next question? Or, what do you think? Somebody. It's a capacitor. It's a capacitor. What kind? A variable capacitor? Yep. Oh, I know that's in here. Okay. It is a variable capacitor because it has the arrow. Okay. I know that question's in there. Oh, well, anyway. What do the symbols on an electrical schematic represent? They represent components different components, not logic states. No. Which of the following is accurately represented on elect in electrical schematics? The way the components are interconnected. They can be laid out on the board or on the chassis in any way as long as the connections are right. Which of the following devices or circuits change an alternating current into a varying direct current signal? Back here, number five, we said it was a diode. Okay. I have to think about it. It's also called a rectifier if it is used to change AC to DC. 
It's a diode, but it will be referred to as a rectifier. It comes from the old days when there weren't diodes, the only thing there were was rectifiers. Okay. What is a relay? It's an electronically controlled switch. Everybody but Alex has used one of those this morning. Do you know where? Your car. When you turn the, the biggest one is always there, is when you turn the key to hit the starter, there's a relay out on the starter that when you turn that switch, a small current snaps that switch shut and starts the starter. Otherwise, you would need a cable bigger than my finger coming the whole way back to the, to the key and back to the starter. And even then, it probably wouldn't be big enough, okay? So it's an electronically, electrically controlled switch. It's an electromagnet that closes the switch. Uh, the lights in here I don't think are, but some places they are. That was a 70s thing. Holy cow. What happened? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't know why that was done for so long, and then all of a sudden it quit. It was it was done in the 70s when the price of copper was crazy. Oh, okay. So they did it to reduce the amount of thicker wire that was being used. Okay. So they used little bold, they used little bold switching. They and looked a, like little paddle switches. Yeah. Like rock and, it, and, and the wire that went down to the switch was only uh, like a furnace uh, thermostat wire. Okay. Another reason a lot of places did that, especially if it, if the kids involved, like schools or yeah. university schools, low voltage. Okay. By safer condition. Yeah. Okay. All right. Gee, I learned. I I'll tell you, I learned something in every every class. And when that didn't go over well, they tried aluminum wire, which even went over worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. What type of switch is represented by component three in figure T2? Uh, and I don't, yeah, okay. It is a single pole, single throw switch, which means that it's got one path through it, single pole, and it doesn't have two ways out, it only has one. It's either off or on, as opposed to a double throw that they mentioned there, which would have two paths out. Which of the following displays an electrical <coughs> quantity as a numeric value? We've gotten away from these. They're called meters. You know, you still see them in the sci-fi movies <laughs> on the on Doctor Death's machine, the needles going up and down. It's called a meter. But uh, we use LED graphs, things like that today, because they're cheaper. Uh, a meter is a really intricate piece of equipment to, to make. A bar graph is, they stamped them out. What type of circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? It's called a regulator. Uh, and we don't have one in there. What it is, it's a circuit that makes sure that no matter what the input voltage is, the output stays the same. And the one rule is the input voltage has to stay higher than the out. Although there are some new regulators that will do that, do the others. Electronic equipment not only does not like AC, it likes a certain voltage and nothing else. If your cell phone gets something that varies much beyond 4.8 and 5.3, it doesn't like it. And that wall socket, oh, I thought there was one there, but it's not. That wall socket voltage will vary from 104, 105 up to 137. And that's numbers I personally have seen. And that doesn't include brownouts. They go down to 90. And nothing works well there. So regulators, gosh, there's probably one or two regulators in your cell phone. 
because they're even regulating the battery voltage going from the battery into the cell phone. What component is commonly used to change 110 volt AC house current to a lower voltage AC for other uses? It's called a transformer. Remember I talked about the transformer having 100 turns of 10? That's ridiculous. It's probably 330, but the idea is the same. <coughs> it's the ratio. The more turns of the, on the output side, the higher the voltage. Which of the following is used as a visual indicator? I got it. You've seen how many of those so far this morning? LEDs. I got about six of them in the living room that I see when I go out the morning. Which of the following is combined with an inductor to make a tuned circuit? A tuned circuit in audio, the equivalent is a tuning fork. If you take a tuning fork and set it in the room, and you hit the right note on a piano or even sing it, the tuning fork will vibrate. A tuned circuit is the same way. If you hit it with an electrical signal that is at its tuned frequency, it will sit there and the voltage will go up and down. Now you can't see it, but it happens. It's called a tuned circuit. It's an inductor and a capacitor, a coil, and a pair of plates. And depending on the values of those, what frequency it is. I think in the general or in the extra class, we, we discuss the formula for doing that. I forget which one. Which, what is the name of a device that combines several semiconductors and other components into one package? It's called an integrated circuit, okay? We have gotten to such high level integration that we now put billions of transistors on a piece of stuff that's this big. They're called SD, mini, micro SD chips. Okay, what, oh, what is the function of component two in T1? Component two, it controls the flow of current. This is a well-designed, relatively well-designed DC adapter, what we sometimes refer to as a wall ward, the thing that plugs into the wall and charges your cell phone or whatever. It's a relatively well-designed one because it has a diode here that if the voltage goes up too far, it will it will conduct and blow the fuse. Number two is a fuse. Okay. By the way, that component symbol has changed. It used to be two dots with a curve between it. If you look at an old diagram, you'll find that. Okay. What is, which of the following is a resonant, which of the following is a resonant or tuned circuit? Back to another question we had a little bit ago. An inductor and a capacitor connected either in series or in parallel. And they form a filter. They will either reduce the signal at that frequency or they will enhance the signal at that frequency. One of the two. Which of the following is a common reason to use shielded wire? Keeps the bullets from hitting it. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, to prevent coupling of unwanted signals to or from the wire. It's sort of the same idea. If you have two wires that run in parallel to each other for any distance, they will talk to each other. The signals in one will get into the other. You put a shield around them, that reduces that. Also does some other things. But it prevents coupling of unwanted signals. I had a friend who cleaned up his uh, computer desk. Had cables all over the place. He cleaned them up, laced them down real nice and pretty. And nothing worked afterwards. Because he had some wires running next to each other that shouldn't be. 
cut off all the tie wraps, scattered them out. Everything was okay again. <laughs> uh, I don't think he's cleaned up a desk since. Which term describes the ability of a receiver to detect the presence of a signal? I got in trouble with this set, this question a couple months ago, and I ain't going to say what I did. Uh, okay. It is the sensitivity of the circuit, how sensitive it is. Can it, re can it hear a one microvolt signal, or can it hear one that's more sensitive or lower? It's how small the signal can be, sensitivity. Reason I'm spending time on that is because there's another question that talks about the other attribute, and I thought it was next, but it's not. What is a transceiver? It is a unit combining the functions of a transmitter and a receiver, both in one package. It can be a handheld, it can be a base, it can be a mobile. Back in the 60s, we bought a receiver and we bought a transmitter. And we set them down next to each other, and then we had to wire something to make them work together. Today, we buy one package in most cases. It's called a transceiver. Which of the following is used to convert a radio signal from one frequency to another? It is called a mixer. I'm going to talk about this in another question. But what we do is we mix two signals. And when we mix two signals, two frequencies. We will get the sum and the difference of those two frequencies. If you mix 10 with 60, you will get 50 and 70, as well as the 10 and the 60 coming out. Now what you need to do is pick the one you want. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that kind of concept. By the way, this is no different than music. When you hit keys on a, on, a, on a piano and you hit three of them, you have three tones, but you actually have about 30, I think it is, when you take all of the mixed components of it. And by the way, think about what one key on a piano sounds like versus a nice chord. What term describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals? Talked a minute ago about sensitivity, how small of a signal you can receive. This says, can I take two signals that are adjacent to each other and pick one of them? Because that's all I want. I do not want to hear W, uh, I do not want to hear station 960 and 1010 together. I want to hear one or the other. And that's called selectivity. Selecting. What is the name of a circuit that generates a signal at a specific frequency? This is the electronic equivalent of a tuning fork that you hit. When you turn it on, it produces a frequency. One frequency. If it's a good one, it's a pure frequency, like a tuning fork. It has a lot of uses. They can be fixed and they can be varied. You can be able to change a frequency or it can be setting on what. The basic for every transmitter is an oscillator. You start out with an oscillator, it produces a small signal at the right frequency, and then you step it up. Now, so they're more complex than that, but that's the idea. What device converts the RF input and output of a transceiver to another band? This is called a transverter. I've lobbied to get this question out of here because this is, this is a device that is not used much anymore. Back in the old days, the VHF and UHF guys could not buy a sideband transmitter. They just weren't, didn't exist. So what they would do is build a transverter that would take 10 meter sideband, which you couldn't get transmitter, transmitter for. Mix it, we mix 30 megahertz with an oscillator at 
114 megahertz. 30 plus 114 is 144. Likewise, you take 144, marks it, mix it with what was it, 114, and you get 30. So going both ways, you could have that one oscillator and you move it, move the frequency. And what it did was allowed us to get onto bands. At one time, it was a real good, good thing because of where technology was. Today, it's an expensive way. I'm building one right now for the new, very low frequency bands that we've just gotten, simply because there's nothing commercial out there. Although I heard recently there is, but now that I got the parts and stuff, I'm going to finish it. But it's called a transverter. What is meant by PTT? Come on. <laughs> the push to talk function that switches between receive and transmit. Which of the following describes combining speech with an RF carrier signal? Modulation. How many of you ever heard of a modem for data transmission? It took the, the signal and modulated it, put it on the phone, took the phone signal and demodulated it. The word modem <coughs> is modulate, demodulate together. But it's called modulation. What it does is it takes a nice pure RF signal, takes the audio, <coughs> and builds those sidebands. Okay, all it does is builds the sidebands. What is the function of a si single sideband CWFM switch on a, a VHF power amplifier? Okay. What is a VHF power amplifier? It's a thing you can hook to your HT. Plug it in, plug the power into the cigarette layer on the car, no kidding. And when you squeeze the transmit button on the HT, it sends five watts to the power amplifier. The power amplifier sends 40 watts to the antenna. Okay? Now, unfortunately, they cost almost as much as it as a as a boat. But there's a value. There's places where they're nice. Set the power the amp what this switch does, if you have one that will do all modes, is it sets the amplifier for proper operation. The the mode that will work for CW, the mode that will work for sideband, does not work for FM. And that's why. So you have to flip the switch. It has to know what it's amplifying. Okay. Just take it for face value. There's a switch there, and it sets the amplifier to make it work. Uh, I have a half hour description of why. We'll skip that. What device increases the low power output from a handheld transceiver? It's an RF power amplifier. I have one of them. <coughs> I paid about 100 bucks for it. And it's really nice to have because I have one HT that does something that none of my others do. And if I really need that function with 40 watts with higher power, I hook it up. But I'll tell you what, it's in a box at home. And I saw it the other night when I was looking for something. And I haven't used it for probably two or three years. It's not one of those things, but it's an RF power amplifier. Now, this is the other side of that same box. Where is an RF preamplifier installed? Notice this is preamplifier, not power. Preamplifier works the other side. It takes the weak signal off the antenna and makes it stronger to go into the receiver. It makes the receiver more sensitive. It also amplifies the noise. It doesn't help your signal and noise. But it's connected between the antenna and the receiver. 
Now, when you're working with a transceiver, you got one output or one connection. So that means that when you go to hit the button, you've got to connect the RF amplifier, RF power amplifier. And then when you let off, you have to connect the RF preamplifier. That would be a real nuisance. Most of these come with the two of them in one case with a circuit that senses when you hit the button and switches it for you. Okay. And matter of fact, that's one of the big cost items is, is that. But it's connected between the antenna and the receiver. It's a valuable piece of stuff at times. It's not something I recommend a new ham buy, okay? Uh, I have one, like I said, I have one, but you know, it doesn't get a lot of use. Um, I'll tell you what it is. I have a digital HT that I rarely use. And if I need it with higher power, instead of going out and buying a $400 to $500 D-Star mobile, I can use this $100 amplifier. What can you do if you told, are told your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over deviating? I love that word. Talk further away from the microphone. I mentioned earlier yesterday about if, if, you, if they say you're, you're breaking up, it may be you're talking too loud, talk further away from the microphone, lower your voice, whatever. What would cause an AM, a broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintentionally? It happens once in a while. The receiver is unable to reject strong signals outside the AM or FM band. It's a lot better today, but at one time, most of our portable home radios, car radios, were pretty bad. They, were, they weren't real good. Today, you don't see this very often unless you get close to a 200, 300 watt transmitter. Used to be the police low bands would wipe out FM radios into cars. You've got, you've got a half a block from one of the, uh, one of the uh, KGB 554 radios. That's not familiar. Get close to one of those, and uh, within a block, you'd lose FM. Of course, you knew he was there, too. <laughs> you lose the car when you're driving that route. What? You lose the car when you're driving that Oh, okay. Yeah, well, you wouldn't there. We, uh, at that time, in the 60s, I helped repair one. one of the, it was a fishing game guy. I had a problem with the radio. The radio was in the trunk. It was like that big. And had a whole raft of tubes in it. They would also close garage doors. Oh, they would do all kinds of things. <laughs> You'll when these drive through and keep the mic and mess up the computer system. Really? Time. Oh, you would. This is a low band radio back in the day. Yeah. The low band, yeah, well, out in central Illinois, I don't know if they still do, but in the early 2000s, the police were still running low band. They were running low band and they were running significant power. Because yeah, you could probably talk from one end of the state to the other. Well, yeah, you know, well, not quite, but <laughs> darn close to it. Yeah, okay. They also still had the 102-inch whips on the back of the car. Because on that flat land, you don't need repeaters. You can talk for, you know, yeah. Uh, okay. Which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? These are three concepts, not three things. Fundamental overload, 
That's what you were getting when you go through the Wendy's drive-in and wipe things out. It's not the fact that you're transmitting on the wrong frequency, it's the fact that the equipment can't handle that strong of a signal. Harmonics. Oh, back in the old days, we had Channel 11 Fringe TV in this area. We could, at least at my home down, down south of Mount Holly, I could, we could get Channel 11. Had to have a good antenna, 30 feet, 40 feet up. But channel 11 is at 196 to 202 megahertz. Or channel, yeah, channel 11. Six meters, which is what I was running, is 50. <coughs> I was running at about 50.1 or two. Four times 50 is 200. My fourth harmonic was wiping out one of my neighbor's TV channels. Channel 11 was a sports channel. Can you imagine the guy out on the pit bound winding up to throw the pitch and I hit the transmit button just as he's releasing the pitch? It causes all kinds of consternation, okay? I did find out and I didn't have that much fourth harmonic. I mean, our own TV was okay. But this neighbor's TV was just not real susceptible to things. The fourth harmonic might have been being created in his TV set. That can happen. That's harmonics. Times two, times three, times four, times ten. Uh, okay. You can hear and I don't care how good a transmitter is, there's a little bit of that. You can never totally get rid of it. Spurious emissions. One of the things these transmitters do is they don't start out with 144.333 or whatever. They start out with one frequency and they mix it with another frequency to get to 144 internally. It's like a transverter. Yeah, internal. Well, you've got all these other frequencies floating around there, plus the frequency of the microprocessor that's inside. If I sit next to a transmitter or a receiver, even when it's not transmitted, with a good receiver that can go the bands, I can find spurs. The only way you find it is you find a spur and then you click the receive the unit off and on, and if it goes away, it's coming from that one, okay? But the spurious emissions. If you've got birdies anywhere, something in your house is creating a frequency, and it's a matter of finding it. Now, I'm gonna tell you, you have a heck of a resource if you ever have problems. I'm not talking about ham radio, I'm talking about anything. You have a heck of a resource that you can tap into as a hand. Anybody can, but you know where it's at. That's a big difference. You get down and you get a hold of Jack. Jack finds one of the guys in the club who has a wide band receiver and a directional antenna. And in most cases, these guys are just happy to get a chance to get, play with their toys. They'll come out and help you. It might not be exactly the day you want it, but it'll happen. And uh, I'll give you one. Uh, shopping center down around Philadelphia. All of a sudden they're having car thefts. And it's centered around one store. One car theft after another. And they're trying to figure out why. And the people are insisting that they use the key fob to lock their car. Of course, you probably know how reliable that is. But there's dozens of them, and everybody's saying they lock the car with the key fob. Well, that makes it a little harder. They can't find it. Finally, one of the police officers said, let's get a, one of the hams out here and see what they can find. They come out, and they found out that there was a transmitter, the, the, the door guard thing, that you go out, 
to light up those, uh, what are they called, strips, they use a transmitter. And they found that transmitter was producing way more power than what it should have. And they could, it's got a strong signal out in the parking lot. The key fobs are on the same band. The car's receivers are not that good. They were getting overloaded. The guy hit the button, but nothing happened. And he walks away from an unlocked car. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about <coughs> Part 15 devices, but this is a good place to do it. That transmitter is a Part 15 device. It's a device that produces any kind of energy. By the way, that laptop, that projector are Part 15s. They're licensed by rule, but they're okay as long as they don't interfere with anything else. <clears throat> if I'm sitting here and somebody walks in and says, you're interfering with this, you gotta turn it off. I either turn it off or I'm in trouble. So they walk into the store, the hand hands the gal the Part 15 declaration, which by the way, is on most of this equipment or at least on the book that comes with it, and says, you gotta turn that thing off. And she says, I gotta call the home office to do that. He said, no, you don't understand. Home office isn't the one that's going to jail or pay the fine. You're the one who's going to jail or pay the fine if you don't turn it off because you're in control of it. She's the control operator. She turned it off. They had a tech come out about a couple hours later and they found out that the transmitter somehow had a wrong setting on it and it was producing Way, way more than what it should have. Part just, yeah. If I could interject just a short, yeah. very short personal experience. In 1979, I started working at a local company called AMP. AMP. Oh. Based in Harrisburg. I was an engineer. They were going through a process of all their connectors getting rid of the metal shells. Connectors at that point either had a metal shell or they had a total plastic body. Plastic was cheaper than stamping and plating the metal shells, so that's what they were in the process of doing, except maybe for the military connector. I was a ham. I read up, kept reading USD magazine, staying up with ham stuff, even though I wasn't an active ham. <coughs> That's when, guess what, sprung up like crazy, personal computers. IBM and Boca were down Florida. They were everywhere. In businesses at homes, everywhere. People started noticing interference like you were talking about. Things that were being interfered with were police communications, aircraft control operators, emergency services, ambulances, etc. Well, the FCC started taking notice of this, had to investigate, naturally, and what they found out was that computer-operated equipment was radiating like crazy. Mm -hmm. You connect a computer to another computer or to a network via a cable. Most of, at most, those cables were twisted pair. They still radiated, even though twisting the pairs helps. Okay, and it was just a crazy time. I noticed this and I went to our division manager in the part of AMP that I worked in because I worked on computer connectors, RS-232, you might still recognize. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Had a metal shell. We were designing the metal shells out and I went into my, my division manager and I said, stop. And I showed him an article where a company in Las Vegas that made computer equipment who had been warned several times by the FCC to quit it, to change their design. The company refused, they were making megabucks. The FCC locked the doors of that company and the owner of the company ended up in jail. Okay? And I showed this to my division manager and I said, you're trying to eliminate all metal in our connectors. You've got to rethink that 
and here's the best example I can give you, a real example. Interference can be harmful, and if we don't change course, who's going to end up in jail next as a manufacturer? Okay, and that just changed everything. Suddenly we started coming out with metal shells where we never even had them before. Because of the shielding properties. Yeah. Because you could, you could use yeah, a uh, shielded cable, not just twisted pair, but twisted pair with an overall shield around it, and okay. you could ground it all, and that became second nature. But it was interesting to work in those times and be on the ground floor, so to speak, of a change in corporate attitude mm -hmm. because they realized, oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, that's what the uh, ferric choke does on the uh, power cable, is it keeps the stuff from the computer from going out the cable. There's, there's a lot of ways to do it, but certainly using shielded cable and yeah. shielded computers has to be part of this. Everything, it's, it's, a, it's not one thing, it's a, it's, a, it's a group. But if you ever wind up with trouble with anything, in uh, 2008, I believe it was, there was a radio station down in the Lancaster area that broke a ground in their transmitter. Didn't know it. Did have, if something happened internally. And they were wiping out all kinds of stuff. The Camp Hill Mall, that far from Lancaster, their portables that they were using to communicate with their people were having trouble. Uh, it just, it was, it was bad news all around. So, yeah. all right. Uh, let's go about two or three more, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, all, by the way, that's one of the all of those connect correct. All of those are correct. Unfortunately, you can't count on that. It's not a. Some of them are, are and some of them aren't. Which of the following is a way to reduce or eliminate interference from an amateur transmitter to a nearby telephone? Put an RF filter on the telephone. That RF filter, the easiest RF filter to start with, is a ferrite choke. You put it on right up against the phone. Uh, by the way, like I said, one good turn deserves another. If one helps, try the second one. How can the an over how can an over can overload of an on amateur radio or TV by an amateur <laughs> signal be reduced or eliminated? Block the amateur signal with a filter at the antenna input of the affected receiver. Uh, one of the guys I had trouble with in my area was a guy with channel two problems. We we put a uh, now by the way it wasn't my transmit it was somebody else's. We bought a filter for fifteen dollars and I want you to think about fifteen dollars in nineteen fifty. That's one hundred and fifty now or 1960. So we bought the filter, we took it out, we put it on his TV and the problem went away. A couple weeks later, he calls again, complains of guys interfering. Go out, take an angry look, the filter isn't on. He said, well, I didn't like the looks of that hanging there. It was behind the TV. At that point, we kind of told him it either went back or on or we weren't going to listen to complaints. Which of the following actions should you take if a neighbor tells you your station's transmissions are interfering with their radio or TV reception? You make sure your station is functioning properly. It doesn't cause interference on your own radio or television when it's tuned to the same channel. That's always a good indication of the problems on the other end. Now, I will say two things here. Number one, you will as a new ham, you'll probably need help on that. Go ask for help. Okay? Yeah, go get it. The other thing is how you handle this. Uh, he has an article there about the guy who just got fined $18,000. One of the things that was in the letter to Smith, Laura Smith, who is the FCC person who deals with this. 
she reports to either an FCC commissioner or the person below them. So she's pretty well up in the organization. She lives in Gaysburg. Uh, he told her in his letter, it's bad enough to say this to somebody, but he wrote it. Go pound sand. Oh yeah, not a good thing, okay? I don't recommend that you give a neighbor a hard time. See if you can work it out with him. Otherwise, he's going to be out talking to you and the neighbor when you're having uh, an altercation in the yard. And you don't want him. Right. Okay. I don't know if it would be you, but something like that. Which of the following can reduce overload to a VHF transceiver from a nearby FM broadcast station? If you happen to be in the shadow of a big FM radio station, you can have problems. There are ways to fix that. It's basically put a band reject filter on your, on your transceiver between it and the antenna. One of the worst things to be near is a paging transmitter. They are just absolutely awful. They, they are terrible in the signals that they put out. They have them jacked up above what the power limits that the thing should operate on. And when you jack a transmitter up above its design, it really starts to do all kinds of nasty things. If you're near a, if, if you're having problems and there's a paging transmitter within 10 blocks, suspect it. Hospitals are one of the worst places for us to get a ham radio station to work. Um, they really use pagers on everything else does. Oh yeah. They not only use pagers, but the transmitter is usually in the hospital. And it's antennas sitting up next to the ham radio antenna. What should you do if a neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur station? Work with the neighbor to identify the offending device. Politely inform your neighbor about the rules that prohibit the use of devices that cause interference. Check your station and make sure it meets standards of good practice. If you can fix the problem on your own, fix it. The alternative is to chuck a grenade in the, in, in the neighbor's house, and that's not recommended. All of those choices are correct. I've dealt with these. And I think it's one of the reasons why I don't have trouble with neighbors now is because I've learned that there are things that are just plain stupid to do. You know, telling the neighbor he's number two is not a good idea. That's where you're giving the number one with both hands. Okay? Telling the neighbor that, you know, I'm going to call the FCC and they're going to be out here and your butt's going to be in jail is not a good idea. Working with him. If he's got a piece of equipment that's bad, fine. One of the worst things right now is some of the home centers like Lowe's and what's the other one? Home Depot. Home Depot are selling commercial lights, commercial LED lights to, as residential. Commercial has a higher in, interference level legal. FCC allows them to create more interference. I don't know why, but they do. And some guy installs those in your home. The other big thing that's going on is some of the new air conditioners have an 18 megahertz output. That just, it not only creates problems on 18, but multiply 18 by whatever. <coughs> And it's a multi-speed motor of some sort that's in it. Okay. I'm reading all kinds of stuff. As some of this stuff gets more sophisticated, we're getting more RF out of it. And I'll tell you, I have got a couple of concerns about it. One of them is what it does to other services. But one of the concerns that I have is what it does to human bodies. And I don't know, there isn't enough information on that. 
one little side light. If you have a, I hope you're not doing it, but if you have a wife, girlfriend, daughter, somebody you care about who is sticking their cell phone in here to carry it in that nice convenient pocket on their chest, there is empirical evidence that that is a breast cancer risk. I'm talking a significant number of cases. Get them to stop. Okay? We'll talk a little bit later about that kind of thing, but I'm thinking about it right now. Get them to stop. I have talked to all of my girls that I work with, daughters, granddaughters. I'm hoping none of them do because I've asked them not to. Okay, let's take 10 and we'll get back and keep moving here. Anybody like this? 